I think one of the things that was so shocking about the measles epidemic is it's 2017, and we all grew up at one time or another getting vaccinated for one thing or another. How did that happen? How did all of a sudden this group of people be impacted by this and it affect the medical industry as dramatically as it did? Ah, oh, that's a long story. Um, <laughs> It's a very complicated, you know, it's, it's a really complicated story. I think on one hand, it's it's access to information, right? And the quality of that information is, is an issue because we have two groups of people. We have the State Department of Health that says measles are safe um, and health us saying measles are safe, and then you have the activists saying measles are not safe. And they come in all shapes and colors right now, the anti-vaccine um, community. And I think um, just as in, in healthcare we say do no harm, a lot of parents are in that mode, so abstaining is their one way to do no harm than actually taking action. You know? So that, I mean, that's the kind of the, my short answer to, to a complicated, complicated. For the measles outbreak, you said that in this community that wasn't a problem because there were women who were working with people locally. Can you talk more about that, about how, what ha is happening locally that it wasn't a problem here, about what the women are doing and about that model? Um, I think it's just a sense of connectedness to each other um, and getting proximity to places like us and the health commons that at least they can go to someone they trust to give them the right information um, about it. Um, I think it's easier to ask your neighbor about this than sometimes it is to ask a healthcare person. So the reason I reference the women and give them some credit is because they are here 24 hours. I'm not here, I live in the suburbs. <laughs> um, and I'm still a nurse, right? I'm still a healthcare provider um, and someone with authority that probably shouldn't be trusted um, you know, in some ways. So I think just the women and the, the men and the, the, this long period of time that we were in the neighborhood, I mean, it's six, six years since the center opened and four years prior, talking about how do you keep, you know, we had an initiative called Growing Up Healthy and See the Riverside where we train the women to talk about pregnancy, you know, to talk to mothers about child development before they even got pregnant. Um, so there are things that happened over the last 10 years, I think that is really, um, has caused the change. Um, we had parenting classes for men and, you know, so it, it, it's a lot of, of the 12 different things happening, that's what I meant. Um, there was a conversation happening um, and sense of connectedness that probably didn't happen you know, people that live in, uh, in isolated suburbs on their own. Hi. Uh, who are some of the other non-traditional holistic health care models or um, service providers in the Twin Cities that you respect and are kind of inspired by right now? Holistic health providers. Say more. Because <laughs> there are a lot of them that I respect. Well, so the so. People's Clinic is... Um, a non-traditional model, yeah. um, and it's community sustained. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering what other organizations in the Twin Cities are like that drawing on yep. that kind of model. Um, so there is the Southside Community Health Services. There's Cook Clinic, um, North Point Health and Wellness, um, in the side of the river, uh, Indian Health Board, Native American Community Clinic. Um, there are about. 10 of us in Minneapolis. And then in the St. Paul side, we have Open Cities, West Side Community Health Services, and um, United Family Medicine. So well, there's about 17 of us in the state. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful, inspiring talk. And I'm so excited to take some of those ideas into my own work. What are some projects that you're working on right now that have really got you juiced and excited about this stuff? Because you talked about some of your successes and the organization you're a part of. And I'd just love to hear a little bit more about what you're sinking your teeth into right now. So the project, thank you for asking. Um, the project that I'm really excited about is we're, we're thinking about completely redesigning our service delivery model. And, and those of you who are in healthcare you ha have heard about the culture of health model that comes out of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and looking at that food is medicine, exercise is medicine, um, you need to look at community development in ways that we don't think about 
you know, that the healthcare providers need to think about education, jobs, um, and mental health in a much more deeper sense than um, when we think of just get a therapist or, you know, give people something for five minutes or 30 minutes or, or an hour. Um, we are uh, thinking about you know, using our gym and, and opening, uh, you know, making it, turning into a wellness center where the complementary services can happen, like massage and and um, acupuncture, because we have a lot a lot of patients that have chronic pain, and the pill is not working. Right? It's creating more societal problem than than we want. Um, we're thinking about the food delivery systems that are um, multiple models are out there, open arms. One is the one where we, people, food is cooked and people are you know, getting it. It doesn't work for a lot of people because you have to be sick to eat that, right? It's kind of a prescribed food. Um, and people want to cook their own food sometimes and they're young enough to be able to do that, but they may not have a transportation um, to go to the grocery store and, and know what to cook. Um, for their particular uh, disease. So how do we do a prescription? And, and our providers are very excited about that, but we're overwhelmed by the thought of then from that prescription to the end outcome of someone cooking and eating, how do we make sure that happens and we facilitate the steps it takes for someone to be to, to actually benefit from it. Same thing, we can turn our space into a wellness center. How are we gonna get people to come? Only 30% of our patients live in the neighborhood. You know, we have patients coming all the way from St. Cloud and Wilmer and other places, and but they have the same problem. So how do we get 10,000 people access to things that we can offer to local community? And for the local community, sometimes um, it, it takes a whole shift, right? Um, because to think of people center, you think of fixing still. You think of you get something quick. Now when we tell you, you have to actually work out this many times to get the desired outcome, how does that change our relationship with the community? Our brand, our way of thinking about our work. Um, so it, it is much more complicated, you know, but I'm very excited, excited to begin that journey because I think it's the right thing to do. As far as like working with uh, people from a diverse like multicultural background what do you see or what insight do you have as far as like the most important characteristic or personal trait someone dealing or not dealing but you know what I mean involved in that um to have I'll say two and they really go well together I think you have to have a passion for the work this work does not pay well <laughs> um so it, it, people have to be really deeply passionate about that and have a kind of a moral sense or a personal sense of satisfaction in doing this hard work. Because if, if you're a doctor working at People Center, it's much, much harder than if you're a doctor at a Fairview Clinic. Let's just be honest. Um, because you're dealing with people that have really um, difficult, have had trauma, they've had, they have a lot of barriers to basic things that are the social determinants of health. Um, and then the second thing I would say is empathy. Because the reality of it is by the time you finish medical school, you're not poor. <laughs> um, so it's your ability to relate, even if you come from poor background, um, is very difficult. So you have to rely on that empathy, that understanding that you can actually imagine how hard that person's life is and that you're willing to go on that journey with them and you're willing to actually think about them much more than just a patient that they have lives and that you care about what's happening to them outside of the clinic. All right, last one. Perfect, this will be fun. All right, I got a question on justice. Um, justice as you displayed it from a structural change, mm -hmm. how are you leveraging your role as a CEO differently than a classical CEO, whether in a nonprofit or a profit, to implement that type of justice to implement a structural change. That, that's a it's question. It's an easy I, one. It's an easy one. <laughs> Maybe Drew can answer for me. <laughs> um, I, I think you know I'm forced, whether I like it or not, to to get engaged in a lot more policy discussion than I would feel comfortable sometimes, um, and stick my neck out because there's a danger in, in that from a career trajectory perspective. Um, especially when you're a young woman of color, I mean, it's, it's really hard. Um, but I think it's the right thing to do for the work I'm doing. 
you know, I, I, I really enjoy looking at um, the policy decisions that are being made, how it affects the ability for community to be well before they even come to us. And us being the conduit between the people who make decisions and people who are impacted by those decisions. Because I get invited to tables that my cousins are not invited to, right? Um, that the, a lot of our patients are not invited to. We've had politicians come, even uh, Mr. Sanders was in our clinic. We, we always invite and bring them so because we want to give our patients the opportunity to talk to people who are making decisions about their lives. Um, so I think, you know, I've worked at a large health system. I worked for a large insurance company. Those CEOs or even the executives or the director level people like me never got got asked to do that. You were just told to do what is good for the business. And I think I'm in a position where I'm asked to do what's good for the community. Um, and just make sure that it doesn't bankrupt us, <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Good questions, guys. Sara, thank you.